Well, good morning and welcome to Solid Rock. It is uh, great to see you guys, whether that is here in the building with us or um, just watching online through the stream. Um, if you guys are here in the building with us, though, would you just stand and worship right now? Man. 
hands that form the mountains are the hands that form this heart. You crafted time and you've been with me from the very start. Your faithfulness more than the rising sun. Your perfect love could not be over.
are great. And Father, we end this morning by letting you know that you are truly our conqueror and we need you. Father, thank you for always being there for us, even when we don't think we need you. You're right there by our side. Never leave us. And we are so grateful for that. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to lift your name up. We pray now as we are preparing our hearts to hear your word that you would challenge us today, you would encourage us today, and may no person here leave the same way they came in because of the power of the gospel. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, you can be seated. <clears throat> well, happy Super Bowl Sunday. Who's got the Eagles? Who's got the Chiefs? Whoa, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, go Lions back here, so. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a soccer guy, so I'm the football guy on the other side. You know, give me Liverpool, Tottenham, I'm going to be happy. I'll even take Richmond FC, okay, for those of you who know what that is. So some of you guys are going, Richmond FC, yeah. If you know, you know. If you don't, don't worry about it. So it's so great to have you guys here this morning. Um, what, what a day it's been already, and uh, we're looking forward to the rest of this day. If you are one of our guests today, it's such an honor to have you here today. Uh, we have been so blessed in this season of our ministry with so many new families, so many new guests, and we just want to acknowledge who you are and, and just send you a note. So in your seat back pockets, there's an information card. You can simply take that out, fill it out, uh, and you can drop it in. We have two freestanding boxes in back. You can drop that in there. Um, or you can go on our church app and fill it out that way, or on the back of some of the seats, our QR codes. Just hit that with your phone. You can fill out that form that way. But, but we would be honored to know that you were here today as part of our church family. And if you did come prepared to give today, though, like I mentioned, those two freestanding boxes are back there. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, your generosity, and giving to support the ministries of our church. Uh, it's been great to see what God's doing just through giving, through attendance, uh, through guests, through connections. Had a great chili cook-off last night. Had some new winners last night. It was awesome. So it was a really, really great night. So um, if you have crossed the line of faith and you have not yet kind of made that a public profession uh, by going into believer's baptism or water baptism, we are having baptism on March the 19th. Now, as you know, we do baptism, maybe you don't know this, we do baptism twice a year, once in the summertime, outside, and in March, well, given the weather, we may go outside, but no, we're going to do that inside, all right? So it's going to be inside. Uh, we would love for you to, uh, to sign up for that. You can do that via the connection card as well, or call the church office. We would love to talk to you about that and make arrangements for you to be celebrated on March the 19th. Well, through this course of our series on Epic, we've done everything we possibly can uh, to get you into God's Word and to, to give you a 90-day reading plan. As you notice out on the church, the table as you leave or down the Welcome Center, there's a 90-day reading plan. We've encouraged you to read through the Bible. We've put it on our church app to make it very easy for you just to hit that and then check it off when you're done to do that. We've also have it on social media for those who don't know that. And last weekend we introduced you to this, but, but just check out this so you can see what it looks like on social media. Romans 6, 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Romans 6, 12. You know, you never know what you're going to get. So if you're on Facebook or Instagram, check it out on a daily basis. You can see those things there, like those things, share them, whatever you need to do. Well, during the course of this series, we're going to kind of do something a little bit different today. and We'll be introducing something that we're going to see throughout the remainder of this series. And what we've been talking about, as you see by this definition, is the heroic, adventurous life of the gospel change life. And so we're going to be sharing some stories of our own church family attenders members to see what God's doing in their life. So check this out about a gospel-changed life. My sin nature before I met Jesus was one of the flesh. Um, I was raised in a home uh, with a single mom who worked afternoons, so I had, like, run-of-the-mill in my home life. And I was more of a follower rather than a leader, so I just did what all my friends were doing, which led me into a life of um, sexual morality, uh, drugs and drinking from a young age. It was very challenging to know the right things to do because I didn't have any godly voices in my life, and I only had one parent whom I really didn't see too much um, growing up in a family without a dad. It was very challenging, so I just lived for the flesh because that's all that I knew. Uh, I was very empty and extremely lonely, and I didn't know that Jesus was the answer. Um, 
So I came to faith um, at a bar, um, underage drinking. The gospel was presented to me by a friend that I came to the bar with, and my heart was immediately touched in a very miraculous way. And I knew that something had transformed in my heart in that moment, um, even being you know, under the influence of alcohol and drugs. The Holy Spirit I know had come into me because all of a sudden my eyes were just made alive and I just wanted to hear more about the gospel and I just wanted to hear more about my friend sharing about God. And so um, it was that point in time that uh, I changed and I started seeking the Lord and started attending an uncle's church that was local. And, um, and that was when the Lord just started guiding and directing my steps. Another interesting perspective about how the gospel has changed my life was the power of the spirit, like at work, like it's kind of like weights, you know, like the flesh was like a hundred percent and there was like no spirit. And then over time serving the Lord, it just kind of started to like a little bit of give. And then it just kind of would slowly just outweigh itself over time when I would just submit to him, the relationships and the poor choices and all the drugs and drinking and all the things um, was uh, over a span of time. But it was really neat to see the power of God working slowly, um, but steadily and not in a condemning way. Like the Lord is very patient is what I have learned in my first few years of my walk with him. The gospel has been powerful in my life in the ways of going from living like totally in the flesh and um, the way that I changed was that I wanted what was holy, like I wanted the fruits of the Spirit. I wanted um, to be around people who were going to push me to the cross and were going to help convict me and admonish me and grow me and give me hard words so that I could uh, live for him to the best of um, his ability in me. And realizing that um, my life was meant for the glory of God and serving others around me and wherever he leads my steps. So that's how I got where I am today. Amen. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Praise God for the power of a gospel changed life. In fact, can we put our hands together for what God did in uh, Dina Enders' life? I marvel at that. I marvel because of what God did. Um, and far secondarily, I marvel at how closely it aligns with what we're going to be looking at in chapter 8. I mean, it's almost scary. It's incredible. And yet, no wonder, right? This is God's work, and we're going to be talking about how the Holy Spirit uh, gives us the power to live a gospel-changed life. And, uh, you know, putting our hands together for, for what happened in Dina's life, celebrating what God has done in our life. Isn't it awesome to celebrate when something new happens? We do that, right? We celebrate when new things happen in our life that are, that are good. In fact, just this week, we uh, celebrated in my own son's life. He's, he's almost graduating college, and uh, it was a new thing that was good. He, he, he had gotten a job offer from Ford Motor Company. We thought that was awesome. He accepted it, and we said, you know what? That's a new good thing. Let's go celebrate. And we asked him, of course, where he wanted to go, and he said, Ford's Garage, of course, right, in Dearborn. So that's where we went, and I commend that place to you. I'm not getting a commission, but I do commend it to you. But we celebrate things that are new, and there's nothing greater than to celebrate the new life that God gives us through the work of Christ and the power and work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we not only want to celebrate that, my hope is we're going to live more fully in it, right? In this life that God has called us into through his Holy Spirit, the same spirit that worked in Dina, the same spirit that works in us. And so through verses 1 through 26 of chapter 8 of Romans today, I'm just going to let loose our big idea for today, okay? right up front, and that's this, in view of the gospel changed life, the gospel changes us from a self-filled life to a spirit-filled life. A self, Dina used the term the flesh, right? That comes up a lot in Romans, okay? That's what we were before Christ, but then the spirit applied the work of Christ to us, and through faith, we now have the capacity, the ability, the reality of living a spirit-filled life. Less of me, Lord, more of you. And so we need this hope of this kind of life, especially in the face of two giant challenges of the human condition. You and I face them all the time. Chapter 8 gives us hope in the life of them. Sin and suffering. Sin and suffering. And we're going to look at two realities of this new spirit-filled life. First, we have new hope for life, hope of life, in the face of sin. And uh, that's important because sin brings death. We learned that. Pastor Brad took us through chapter 5 of Romans. And so we, uh, we now have new hope of life 
even in the face of our own sin. Uh, Romans 8, 1 through 8 says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For what God has, I'm sorry, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Powerful words. And notice first here, this this new life that we have, new hope of life, we have a new status if you're a Christian. And that's no condemnation for us. No condemnation. Talk about something worth celebrating, right? Amen. It is good news. And and verse 1, isn't, I don't know about you, it's one of my favorite verses in all the scriptures. Uh, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Apart from Christ, we are and were condemned. And that's a righteous judgment. But in Christ, we are so not. Some of you may have struggled with assurance of or maybe an maybe uncertainty about your salvation. Okay, you might be right there right now. Romans 8, by the way, is going to be, we're going to spend a couple of weeks on it, is going to be a, hopefully a game changer for you. But even beginning here in verse 1, can bring assurance because your assurance is not in you. Isn't that good news? It's in him. It's in him, in your union with him. Notice this verse only applies to those who are, quote, in Christ Jesus. That's Christian believers. We are in him because through faith we've been united to him. And that's huge by itself, right? Wasn't it awesome when when Pastor Brad took us through chapter 6 we, we saw these words within verse uh, uh, 5 of chapter 6. It says, if we have been united with him, right? That's the reality. We've been united with him in his death and resurrection. Wow. This is huge. Think of the implications of this. Let's say it's wintertime, so I'll use a snowball analogy. Let's say you've got your snowball and my snowball, right? And we decide, you know, you're going to combine your snowball with mine. So we combine the two. They've been united, and then I throw it, Right? The trajectory of that snowball now, your old snowball now shares in the new trajectory of my snowball. Simple analogy, but spiritually speaking, the trajectory of Jesus, who he is, what he did for us, we now share in that. We've been united that. We have a new spiritual trajectory. It's not just for eternal life in the future. It's for life now, too. That's incredible. And so... Uh, We read these verses. These are two of my favorite in the scripture. They may be my favorites if we were preaching my favorite verse all over again. And it's chapter 6, 10 and 11. It says this, for the death he died, speaking of Jesus, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's a game changer. It's even even, get even better in chapter 8 here. Uh, Because back in 6 here, it says, speaking of Jesus, not only died for sin, he died for our sins. We know that, right? He died to sin. What's what's up with that? What's that about? He broke its reign. He broke its power. It doesn't have dominion over us. He did that. But guess what? You've been united to him. So no wonder verse 11 says what it says, right? You've gone and I have gone from dead in sin to dead sin to sin. It doesn't mean we can't sin. It just means we can not. We have, there's a new power. Sin has gone from being our master to being merely our enemy. There's all the difference in the world between those two, because that enemy, by the way, has been defeated. So you now have the power to say no if you're in Christ. But to do that, you and I need to consider ourselves dead to sin. I have a friend who, uh, he, he, he writes DTS on his hand. And and pen, just to remind him, he's dead to sin because we got to know it, we got to believe it, we got to reckon it true and live out of that, right? But having been saved from, and we'll come back to this because this is so exciting how six rolls up into eight. But 
We've been saved from the power of sin, to be sure, but we also come back to the fact we have been saved from the penalty of sin, no condemnation. And so your being in him means no condemnation to you. And notice in the verse, this little word, that this is true of you now. We don't have to fear the judgment. We're not even con- condemned now. It's incredible. This is for those who are in Christ Jesus. The natural question I need to ask, whether you're watching online or you're in, in person, are you in Christ Jesus? I couldn't ask you a more que- important question. Are you or are you in the flesh, to use the term uh, that the scriptures use? In the flesh. That describes an unbeliever. Remember Dina and her story. She talked about that's all she knew, right? In the first third there. And that's true of anyone until we come to Christ. Then God got a hold of her life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you in Christ Jesus? Have you put your faith in Jesus' person and finished work? And if you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, there's also not only no condemnation, there's a new freedom. There's a new contrast in us, spirit versus flesh, right? Dina talked about that, 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 you know, the up and down of that. And of course, we have the spirit so we can make progress against the flesh. The spirit of life has brought you and me into new freedom through Christ. The no condemnation is because of the spirit of life, as he is called, and the work of Christ. And so in verse 2, we see, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Again, you got to be in Christ Jesus. But you are free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The principle of sin and its resulting death that was at work in you, that its power was over you. You may now, as a believer, experience, certainly, the battle with sin in view of chapter 7. But we do not need to be endlessly in its spin cycle in a defeated way, in any kind of permanent pattern. Law here is perhaps best understood in terms of principle. It's kind of a principle or power of this sin and death. We're no longer in that, no longer under that, because of what is true in verse 3. Verse 3 uh, says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh. So all the law did for us was expose our sin, and in view of interpretation of a uh, uh, part of chapter 7, uh, even excited or perhaps aroused our sin, uh, it certainly condemns us for our sin. And the reality is the law is good. The problem, we are not. That's the problem. And so it's been, we're weakened by the flesh. So we need a greater power, that of God himself, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, which God has done uh, for us in spades and we see part of that in verse 3, verses 3 through 4, last part of verse 3 into 4, it says, um, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So notice this Holy Spirit is called the spirit of life. He changed you and me from a death destined sinner to a life-given saint and with the hope of living what is truly life now. And then we can't even imagine eternity. And so Jesus, in the flesh, he condemns sin to make us righteous, to give us that new standing. We're not just saved from death and hell, though we are, of course, but for new life. God sent his son to condemn sin in the flesh. Notice in the verse, speaking of Christ, uh, he appeared in, quote, the likeness of sinful flesh, end quote. So Christ was real flesh, make no mistake, 100% man, 100% God, but he was without sin. And so that's probably what it's getting there when it says, therefore, uh, quote, in the likeness of sinful flesh, end quote. And here's the reality, because God condemned sin and the flesh through his son, there is no condemnation for you in his son. Your sin is condemned, but you are not. That's the work of Christ for us. Notice the law cannot make you right with God. We have a theological term for that, justification. The law can't do that for you. But Jesus did, by the way, in faith in him. The law cannot make you like Christ. That's called sanctification. 
But the Spirit can do that, right? Gina said it very well, you know, over time, more of the Spirit, less of the flesh, so on. You can't fight sin or be righteous in your own power. I can't. Today should help anyone, any of us, me included. I've got a set of besetting sins. Who has ever been caught in the spin cycle of besetting sin? Sometimes we ask, why can't I do better? And by the way, be encouraged you even care that you have that impulse in you. Ever been there? Maybe you're there right now. And I'm so excited that we, we get to look at the new power that God has given us. So what the law could not do, God did. What God did is, in view of these verses, he sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh of his son, in order that righteous requirement of the law can be met in us. And the implication for us is that what the commandment couldn't do for you, Christ did. Isn't that awesome? Christ did. Christ did. Sin rears its ugly head in our lives, but... It is condemned and defeated. And in view of Romans 6, 8 through, 6 through 8, you're not condemned or defeated, right? Since pull is real, but its power is broken. And also in view of verse 4, we see the requirement of the laws fulfilled, which could mean that its requirement of condemnation, right, was fulfilled by Christ dying for our sins, and certainly that's the case. We're now positionally righteous now in him. Or it could mean we have a new power for righteousness through the Spirit of God. The reality is both are true. And so we can actually make progress in our battle with sin. The the battle is real, but progress is real. The capacity for growth is real. The capacity for greater victory is real. And here's a game-changing truth for you. It's the reason why I brought up chapter 6. Game-changing truth, as we will see even further in chapter 8, is sin not only has no power, no longer has no power over you, but there is a new power in you. I told you it gets better, right? God's spirit. So now no longer has no power over you, including its condemnation, but there's a new power in you. We used to walk according to the flesh. That impulse through our members toward unrighteousness that Brad talked about that affects, uh, you know, uh, how we think, what we see, what we do, where we go. Now we walk according to the Spirit. And to be in the Spirit, as we will say, means to be in the realm, as they would say, or the regime of the Spirit. I might describe it this way, to be under the influence of the Spirit. So we live life under that influence, including his directing us and empowering us. I need him to tell me where to go. And I need him to help me to go there. And you do too. The Spirit brings life where there was once death. We had time. We could talk about the different types of death. There's different ways of thinking of death in light of Scripture, but I I don't have time. But but we have life, life in the Spirit, Uh, life in peace are the words that we see in verse 6. And so here's very important. You don't just have a new position in Christ. Praise God that you do. You have new power through the Spirit. We have been saved not just for eternal life in heaven, but for new life by the Spirit. There's a fullness of the fact that Jesus has saved us from our sins. And notice the last part of of verse 4 is a description of us as believers. It's not just an aspiration. Notice these are descriptive words in the Scripture here. It's not like these are a bunch of commands for us to live up to. This is a life we already possess. I just want to grow more fully into it. So how do we walk in accordance with the Spirit? It has everything to do with our mindset. Verses 5 through 8 are very powerful. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So these verses set out for us further the contrast between those who are in the flesh and those who are in Christ Jesus. Unbelievers and believers. Those who are in the flesh versus those who are in the spirit. Again, this is talking about unbelievers here versus believers. And we see a five-fold description of the mind set on the flesh for someone who is in the flesh. And by the way, if you are in Christ, you are no longer in the flesh. Praise God. It reminds us, too, also that how we think and how we live go together, right? Where your, where your mind is set determines where your life is set, isn't it? It's like, it's like the course uh, setting you might set on a ship. 
That's the thinking. And then the living is where the ship goes. So you see this fivefold, this is really sobering. And it was true of me when I wasn't in Christ. Same with you. Look, listen to these, in view of these verses, listen to what is described here. Hostile to God. Hostile to God. Even my indifference to him was hostility. Hostile to God. Secondly, does not submit to God's law. Third, cannot submit to God's law. Fourth, cannot please God. Fifth, death. I don't know if I got the order right, but I got the things. I mean, that's incredible. That's horrifying and disturbing. If you've never yet put your faith in Jesus Christ, do so. Do so. The, the other consequences are not even worth thinking. I mean, it's just, this all speaks of just a, the mindset of unbelief. And, uh, and for the person, anyone who sets their mind on the flesh, who's dialed in kind of like a radio dial mentally, it results in death, hostility to God, inability to submit to God's law, inability to please God. And if that defines your life, you kind of become almost like, and this is where I was, this is where you were before you came to Christ. We become like a wolf among Eskimos. You think, well, if you're a wolf, you're pretty bad. It's not so bad. No. Here's what Eskimos do. Here's what I read they do to kill wolves. You ready? I hope you're not squeamish. Okay, I hope this is not too hard for people. They'll take a knife and put handle down with the blade up and then wrap some meat around it. And the wolf inevitably smells the meat, comes the meat, starts eating the meat, then starts licking the meat, then starts licking the knife. Can't distinguish its own blood from the blood of the prey. And so they bleed out to death. And there's the dead wolf. That's how you take care of a wolf. That's also how sin is. That's the mindset on the flesh. That's what it ultimately leads to. So if the image is gruesome, let it work for you and me. The reality is what we put in our minds matters. My wife tells my kids, garbage in, garbage out. Right? People who are in IT know that, uh, that phrase. Set your mind in the flesh and you will live accordingly. In Christ, we now, now we have a new capacity for a new choice. We're not condemned to live that way. And the desire to please God, not just the self, is what marks the true believer, right? You, you, you see it in Dina's story. She started to care. That's what happens with you as a believer. You start to care about, when I was not a believer, I didn't care about my sin. Do you care? That's a good sign. In us is now the new impulse of repentance and a desire to live in holiness. I think Dina even used some of those words. You go from a self-filled life to the spirit-filled life. We still battle the flesh. But self-filled life doesn't define us. We go to the spirit-filled life, including going from a self-filled flesh mindset to the spirit mindset. And yet, I don't know about you, I still so often have to battle what goes on in my mind on this side of the grave. So application for us is where is your mindset? Because I want to grow in my capacities with this spirit-filled mindset, this mindset on the spirit. Because key to living out our new life is living out a new mindset, isn't it? So uh, I've been in a devotional called Take Back Your Life. It's by a pastor, Levi Lusco. And in it, he talks about a, a buddy of his name, Kevin Gerald, who said, I love this sentence. He says, thoughts are like trains. They take you somewhere. Right? A train is coming from somewhere, and it's going from somewhere. Is the train of your thought, any given moment in mind, coming from the spirit or from the flesh, and is it going in the directions that come out of that? Do we think enough about our thinking? Where is the train going? Do you want to be on that train? The flesh train or the spirit train? We have trains that run all through Plymouth, right? We're so used to it. Some of you have to wait for them for a long time. A long time. A long time. <laughs> So whenever you're sitting there waiting and frustrated, don't get angry. Get thoughtful. Think about your mindset. Oh, that's a reminder about where my mindset is supposed to go. Set your mind in the spirit. Me too. You and I get life and peace. I love that in, for, within verse 6. And there's great things that come from that. So what are some ways I think we can grow in this? I find that it, you know, oftentimes when you hear sports teams after a game, if they were defeated, they talk about we didn't do this, we didn't do that, we didn't do the other. And they're talking about the basic stuff. We didn't rebound. We didn't move the ball. That's stuff you learn in second grade in basketball, right? Sometimes it comes down to the basics. So let me suggest to us some ways, some basics. Prayer, right? It's harder to set your mind on the things of the flesh when you and I are in communion with God. Scripture, what better to set our mind than the word inspired by the Spirit of God? 
or thinking on the kinds of things that honor God, the kinds of things that Philippians 4, 8, and 9 talk about, or replacing lies that we've come to believe or tempted to believe in our life with the truth, whether those lives come from the devil or our traumas and wounds or our addictions or sin struggles, and finding that countervailing truth or promise in the Scripture that we can apply against that. So much power there that we can lay hold of. Being around other believers filled with the Spirit. So we have new freedom, but we also have new control. And there's a new indwelling by the Spirit. It would be a better way to say it uh, that we have here in verses 9 and 11. 9 through 11 speaks of this new indwelling. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So the ultimate difference between believers and unbelievers is not what bumper stickers are on our car, what T-shirts we wear, what tattoos might have on our arm. It's, is the Spirit in us or not? Unbelievers, not. Believers, yes. We have the Spirit in us. So if you're a believer, you're not in the flesh. The Spirit is in you. And you're in the Spirit. We are under his realm, his regime, his influence. He's active in our lives. And here's news I think that will encourage you and me the next time we're tempted to feel defeated in our struggle with the flesh in view of these verses, is that by the Spirit, we actually have the capacity to live righteous, live in righteousness, to do what pleases God. It doesn't mean we're perfect people this side of the grave. It just means we have a new capacity. And that's enough. That's powerful. That's a game changer. Verse 10 talks about, you know, in view of verse 10, we learn your body and mind is dead because of sin. Right? This body is going to die. But deep within you and me, because of the Spirit, we have life. That's the countervailing truth. And we will never die. In fact, in view of verse 11, you and I will rise again. If you look at verse 11, it could, this could be referring indeed to your and my future resurrection if you're in Christ, or it could mean the new capacity to live now due to the power of the Spirit in us, the same one who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, the good news is both are true of us, right? Either one could be in view and both are true. We will be raised. But there's also the power of the Spirit moving in our lives and and, and, and think about this. The next time you and I are, are tempted to feel that a certain sin or temptation is, 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 is too powerful in our lives, remember that the Spirit who in, is in us is also the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. That's power, right? And that's our power. Not ours, but through the Spirit. So how then do we live out this out? Well, in view of verses 12 through 14, we see these words, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So we now have, in view of these verses, a new obligation, right? Uh, I might be borrowing NIV terminology or something similar to that. Debt, it's, uh, it says uh, here in the, in the ESV, I can't remember what the NIV says, but the ESV, it says uh, 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 debtors, right? So we don't have to pay this. We have a new obligation, a new payment plan, a new indebtedness by us, and it's to live according to the Spirit, not to the flesh. So the new reality of our new life in the Spirit is we have a new obligation. No more making payments to the flesh. When the flesh, with all its seeming power, rises up in us and says, here, make another sin payment. We can say, I'm so sorry. I'm not on that payment plan anymore. I have a new obligation, new indebtedness, because I'm under new leadership, the Holy Spirit. So we have a new obligation to live according to the Spirit under his influence, direction, and empowerment. When employees come under new management, they have no obligation, right? No debted indebtedness to the old bosses, to the old management, right? They don't. So how silly would it be? If the old boss comes sauntering in the office and starts barking orders at people, right? There might be some people who jump because they're used to it. They don't have to. They're not under that obligation. You and I are under new management, too. The Holy Spirit, not the flesh. And it comes around every so often, doesn't it? Barking its orders, doesn't it? And we've been conditioned to jump. I don't know about you. I have been. 
Sadly, sadly, we sometimes listen. We have the capacity to quench the spirit, grieve the spirit. We have the capacity to fall into sin, but we don't have to. We can make progress. We're not indebted to the flesh. I heard recently, there's a guy named Ted Shimmer who shares a story about the, maybe you've heard this phenomenon where they used to take circus elephants, and when they're babies, they, they put something around their neck and chain them to a, a stake that's firmly in the ground such that they can't get beyond the circle around the stake so that they don't harm themselves or others, right? And then after a while, through learned helplessness, having struggled against the stake and not having any power to free themselves, they end up growing and growing and becoming this huge elephant who now has the strength and power to pull the stake out of the ground if they got very determined to do so, but don't, doesn't do it because of learned helplessness. And so it is with us as believers. We can sometimes feel that way, right? The pro- problem is it gets broken, when you realize you're the big elephant who can pull the stake out, you have a, sin no longer has any power over you, and you have a new power in you. That's incredible. We have new power. Verse 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We don't have to live the life of the flesh that leads to death. What are we to do? It says, put to death the deeds of the body. And what does this death lead to, ironically enough? Life. Right? As those deeds of the body die, we get life. And clear application is put to death the deeds of the body. One of the, uh, uh, one of the most famous statements in the Christian condition historically is by a theologian named John Owen. He had a famous statement in a rather famous work called the, mort- I think it was called the Mortification of Sin. We don't title books that way anymore. But... This is an old-time book, but in it he said, be, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Sober. Here's the good news. You can. You can. So can I. So can I. Because the verse tells us. It says, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. Isn't that awesome? Who's to put the death, to death the deeds of the body? Pop quiz. You. Me. There is a responsibility. It's active. The Christian life is not passive. You and I really are supposed to do something. We got work to do. You're the one who does it. Okay? But, but, by whom do we do it? The Spirit. So you can't do it on your own. But you only have to. We do it with the Spirit. How do we do it? We, we will. We work. If we had time, we'd go into... Philippians 2 and talk a few things about a few things, but the reality is as we enter into this and we do so in yieldedness to him as direction and empowerment, God's spirit works together with us and we grow. Don't rely on your own power, but don't deny your own responsibility. It's kind of like this. I have a, a tool up here. It's a ratcheting socket wrench. This is my favorite tool. Part of it just because I love the way it sounds. Can you hear that? Any of you use that? Isn't that so satisfying? That's power, right? Can you hear that over the thing? All right, so it doesn't do me any good if it's over here, right? I have to get off the couch, go do the thing, whatever it is, you know, fixing whatever my wife wants me to do, whatever, and go use the darn thing, right? But I need it, right? I can't, I can't tighten ultimately that fastener, that bolt, or that nut with my fingers. I'm not strong enough. That's okay. That's what this is for. But I got to use it. And yet it's not all on me. I have it, right? The principle of leverage allows me to do what I could not do in my own power. I'm not reducing the Holy Spirit to a tool. Every analogy breaks down. But what I'm saying, though, is there's a capacity of we do, but there's a power to do. And both have to be active. We must fight, but to win the battle, we must go into it. We wage it by the Spirit. And so we can guard ourselves from a passive approach with no responsibility in our heart, on our part, or by the, on the other hand, thinking it's all up to us and feeling frustrated in a chapter 7 kind of, kind of sort of way. To pair, so, so this is a habitual weakening of sin over time. We actually make progress. It's a violent struggle. But we do it under a new obligation and with a new power, but also under a new leader. We can put the death and misdeeds of the body by the Spirit, and we will live according to him. Why? Because we are led by the Spirit. Verse 14 says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. 
And those words, sons of God, leads right into what he rolls into next because the the good news just keeps coming. You ready? Verses 14 to 17 tell us this. It says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So if you have Christ as your Savior, you have the spirit of adoption. He is your adopter. He's brought you into a new family and a new father. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I don't know about you, but I thought the stuff just leading up to this was really good. It gets even even better. The spirit of adoption has brought you into this new family. It says adoption as sons. And if you're female, don't get caught up on that word sons. In that culture, you want to be labeled as sons because they're the ones that got the right of, of, of inheritance, right? We are co-heirs with Christ as his children. And in our adoption, there's all sorts of cool things. There's assurance against fear in view of fifth, verse 15 that I read, right? You see, the, a slave, how does a slave obey? A slave obeys out of fear of punishment, right? We don't have to live that way under God, right? A son has the rights of sonship. And so when it comes to your relationship with God, do you you view God more like a boss and you're his employee, or do you view him as he really is, your loving father? Could meditating on your adoption be a game changer for you in that? He's our loving father. There's just something wonderful about adoption. Because legally, you have the same rights as a biological child. We had some neighbors back in, in the Chicago area when we lived there who, who uh, they, they adopted a son, this little uh, boy from China. And you know what they did? All they did is they just saw the picture and they set their love on him. He had nothing to offer them. He had no hand. He had a hook for a hand, literally. But they just set their love on him. They chose him. They gave him a new family, a new life, a new hope, and a new future. And he didn't have to earn it. And they brought him over, and it was done. And he has as much rights as any of their biological children. That's what God did for us. That's how amazing this idea of adoption is. There's just so much buildup of assurance and wonderful things that this chapter gives us. This is one of them. And so there's also, out of that, assurance of an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. We can actually say, Abba, Father. That's a game changer. Only through Christ can you do that, and the work of the Spirit in you. Right? That's Think of who said these words. Jesus himself, within Mark 14, 36, you can look at it later on your own. We get to now speak to God as Jesus did. And so does your heart genuinely cry out in faith in Christ, Abba, Father? Do you have that heart cry of intimacy and relationship with him? If you do, rejoice, because be encouraged. Only the Spirit can produce this genuinely in you in, in, you in view of these verses. That's incredible. In fact... Speaking of that, there's assurance of being a child of God. One of the great gifts of the Spirit is assurance of salvation, that we're really God's child. He he bears witness with our spirit. That's two witnesses. That's what you need to bear witness to a truth. And so the Spirit of God in you is the legal signature of God's adoption of you. And so if crying out, Abba, Father, is by the Spirit, could that be in view or at least part of the very witness of the Spirit in view of the context that we are God's children? There are other possible subjective or objective ways that people will say the Spirit does this. I don't have time to get into that. But I do press on to the assurance of inheritance that we see in verse 17. Co-heirs with Christ, getting to share in the inheritance. By the way, if God is your father, you want, you got to wonder what our inheritance is, right? How awesome is that? And in fact, uh, that helps us with the reality of sufferings. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this second piece here um, But we see not only would we have hope of life in the face of sin, but also hope of life in the face of our suffering. And we see it beginning here in verse 17. If you plan on walking according to the Spirit, you will receive suffering from those who walk according to the flesh. It's just the reality. right? It says here, uh, uh, And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So with suffering, though, comes glory. 
and vice versa. And so when we suffer in solidarity with Christ as children of God, I think that's what's in view here. And the secret to handling the reality of suffering is the reality of sonship with the hope of glory. Along with many other scriptures we could go to about suffering, but sonship brings purpose to and meaning in our suffering, does it not? It gives us, it takes the surprise out of it. Of course we should suffer, right? As children of God in a sinful world. There's a plan for it. It's juxtaposed with future glory. There's something to look for. There's strength in it, right? We can cry, Abba, Father. And I could say many other things. But notice we see in these remaining verses, I'm just going to read them and make a few comments and then a couple takeaways. In verses 18 to 25, we see hope for creation, where we live, and for us. We go from groaning to glory. Listen to what these words say as we near the end of our time. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Notice, current groanings will give way to coming glory. And in that, we see that there is strength for today and hope for the future. Our current, and and by the way, you notice, uh, creation groans, we groan, and the Spirit groans. There's a groanings by the Spirit. And our current sufferings are not worth comparing with future glory. We could write the list side by side, and you know what? Just throw it out, tear it up, because the future glory is so much greater. It's not even worth comparing. They don't compare. But it calls for eagerness and patience on our part, right? Not easy. It takes faith, doesn't it? But in the face of this groaning by creation, the good news of the gospel implies good news for the earth. Creation will be set free. In a world where people worry about the climate and everything like that, Uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't worry about pollution and things like that, but the reality is let's remember the hope we have as believers, right? This whole thing is going to change. The creation's in bondage now, but it's going to be liberated in the future in view of verse 21. And by the way, the greatest possible thing, uh, I mean this, that a diehard environmentalist should do is become a Christian because they get new life and a new creation to look forward to, right? And by the way, just a quick aside, if God cares for his creation also, even as believers, we need to care for it too, right? So it goes both ways. In fact, God also gives us not only good news for creation, but for us, our bodies will be redeemed. Their adoption will become complete. I don't know about you, but this body, yeah, its, it's days are numbered, right? Aren't you so glad there's something better coming in view of verses 22 and 25? So if you find yourself groaning, literally or figuratively, that's what this is talking about. God's done amazing things, but amazing things are to come. And one day we'll even be saved from sin's presence. Isn't that awesome? Based on 2 Peter 3, 13. And I love how verses 22 and 23 use the language of childbirth, right? My wife had a lot of pain in all three of her pregnancies. But we don't talk about the pain. We talk about the kids. There's all the difference in the world, isn't there? And so that childbirth gives way to future delivery. Our current groanings give way to future glory. Quick takeaways, let's live out the new obligation of no condemnation, killing sin by the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. As Brad and I were talking about this series, he had a great prayer in there. I want to commend it to you. Lord, deflate me. Lord, fill me. Less of me, but Lord, by your Spirit, fill me. I think that's a prayer you and I can pray to help us in this. I encourage praying that. Lord, deflate me. Lord, fill me. And then secondly, don't be surprised by suffering. Let's remember the hope we have in it. Looking to coming glory can give us hope in our present groaning, but we must work by faith, waiting eagerly and patiently. And thanks for your patience. We covered a lot of ground. Let me, let me pray for us. Father, we, uh, we know that there's a lot of stuff in life that we deal with this side of the grave, Lord. There's our sin and there's our suffering. 
And yet we want to say thank you, Lord, that in the face of both of these things, you've given us hope of life. It's a hope that does not disappoint us. It's a hope that we have now and for the future. We praise you and thank you and pray that you'd help us to live that out more powerfully for you in the days ahead because we know we can by your grace. In Jesus' name. Would you guys just stand and worship with us?
coming to Solid Rock this morning. We hope to see you guys again next week. I just want you and nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else. And nothing else.